Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second of this week's talks in the London Luminaries Autumn Series. I'm Chris Harry, a volunteer at Marble Hill. Tonight's talk will woo you away from takeaway food forever. Come with us now as we go back to a time before the cheeseburger. But first, let me introduce you to our chairperson for this evening's proceedings, another of our own modern day London luminaries and trustee of Pope's Grotto, Angela Kidner. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to those of you who are joining us live and to those of you also who are watching us on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much for your in introduction, Chris, and I'm extremely pleased to be here to understudy Judith and to introduce her. This is our fourth season of Luminaries Talks, and the family has grown to 14 historic properties. As well as running these talks, which is the purpose of the Luminaries charity, it is also proving to be a very valuable forum for sharing knowledge and supporting one another in increasingly difficult times. I think every property represented has reason to thank the National Lottery Heritage Fund for their financial support. And of course, we thank all of you for all of that you donate. The Luminary series will be recorded and these recordings will be fully captioned. Now I am delighted to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Judith Hawley, who is not only a well-known and brilliant lecturer in 18th century English literature, but is also a treasured trustee of Pope's Grotto Preservation Trust, who has enriched our project of conservation with so much knowledge and vibrant insights into Alexander Pope and his circle. Take it away, Judith. Thank you so much, Angela. So the topic of my talk today, definitely not the cheeseburger, is whining and dining with Alexander Pope. And I think Pope's most famous lines contain a reference to the theme of my talk. And they are, and I'm stretching it slightly, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Pyrian spring. Their shallow drafts intoxicate the brain and drinking largely sobers us again. So he's playing on the idea of inspiration, drinking spirits, being drunk, and the idea of the, um, the muses inspiring poets with the waters from the Pyrian spring on Mount Helicon. Pope had his own little Pyrian spring in his grotto, and this is a, a, a charming little sketch, quite typical of Pope's own drawing style, little sort of back of the envelope doodle of the interior of the grotto. And I think this dates from about 1740. And perhaps you can see his spring that uh, arises here and he has it run here through a little water feature and out this way. Now, you might know that we've been restoring the grotto recently. And one of the exciting finds we have is that there is a, a, a culvert that diverts the water now uh, from, from about here, this direction and possibly into a banyo that appeared later on. So water, drinking, inspiration, uh, the consumption of, of food um, and the consumption of drink are very much part of uh, the world of Pope's Grotto and Villa. There are lots of other references in Pope's poetry to fashionable drinks as well as ancient and classical ones and I'll just run through a few of them. Some of them are, are quite well known, I just want to uh, draw to your attention that that food and drink are part of the, the world of Pope's poetry and part of his kind of moral and uh, literary universe. You might well know these lines from The Rape of the Log. Hear thou, great Anna, whom three realms obey, does sometimes counsel take and sometimes tay. Tay in that period was tea, was probably pronounced um, tay. Uh, it's like uh, bohe is one of the, the names of a type of tea from that period. And I hope some of you will have watched Olivia Fryman's brilliant talk on the material culture of, of tea. And here we see Queen Anne and the Knights of the Garter at Kensington Palace. The Rape of the Lock is, is set in, in Hampton Court Palace and she's receiving their, their homage. So you see Queen Anne being very ground, ground, very grand. But Pope says that sometimes she's this grand queen. Sometimes she's just sipping a cup of tea. She's taking a cup of tea. The Rape of the Lock also has a description of the making of hot chocolate, and he describes it being in, whirled in a, in a mill, so he's very interested in how it's made. And uh, he also talks about the making of coffee, 
For lo, the board with cups and spoons is crowned, the berries crackle and the mill turned round. On shining altars of Japan, they raise the silver lamp, the fiery spirits blaze. From silver spouts, the grateful liquors glide, and China's earth receives the smoking tide. At once they gratify their scent and taste, while frequent cups prolong the rich repast. So here's a rather grand description of the making of, of coffee. You might have seen some illustrations of 18th century coffee houses. Coffee was one of the great fashionable drinks and is very often drunk in coffee houses, commercial coffee houses in the city. But it's also very popular to make it at home and a whole series of quite fancy pieces of equipment were available for sale for, to put on your sideboard. And these I've taken from uh, recent sales catalogues from, from auctioneers. And all of these items sold for over a thousand pounds. I mean, they're, they're quite rare um, and they're very prized and very expensive even at the time. And one of the things that Pope's pointing out in his description is that um, not just the, the accoutrements, it's, it's like having, you know, you, you can go to a coffee shop and have some you know, grand uh, machine that makes you your, your flat white, or you can go home and you can put a, a, a capsule in your Nespresso machine or, you know, fire up the, the Bialetti on the, on the stove top. So you like to be able to make at home a thing that you can get elsewhere. But it's also about the relationship between um, Britain and the rest of the world. So the altars of Japan are the Japaned, uh, the lacquered trays that the coffee might be carried on. China's earth, that would be the porcelain cups that the coffee is made, and uh, that the cups are, are made out of. So he's, he's demonstrating that the drinking of coffee by fashionable young people in Hampton Court is part of this expanding world of the empire, that all of these grand luxurious goods are going into making their afternoon, get their afternoon a little bit of a kick. Now, when I say luxury, uh, it's, it's a key word in the 18th century, and it, I think it has rather more positive connotations now. If we might think about, I don't know, luxury bath towels or those nice fluffy robes you get in, in luxury hotels. And it's, it's been this really pleasant thing that, that you might uh, aim at and aspire to. But in, um, in the 18th century, luxury was something much more akin to vice. So it was not quite one of the... the uh, this is, yeah, I guess a hangover of the idea of the, the deadly sins. And Samuel Johnson, whose voluptuous and excessive appetite Clive Francis described so vividly in, in his talk earlier in our series, he defined luxury, not Clive, but you know, Samuel Johnson defined luxury in his dictionary as voluptuousness, addictedness to pleasure. So that idea of addiction to something, that it, it's something... Um, you know, really rather bad is something that I think Pope is getting at when he's talking about luxury. Pope liked to present himself as modest in his tastes, tastes and not luxurious in his appetites. And addiction is a kind of dependency. You're dependent on a, a, on a drug very often. And Pope liked to present himself as independent, financially independent and also politically and morally independent. So, so luxury has quite a bad association for him. Let's look at part of his self-presentation. And this is a rather amazing image of Pope's grotto. It's taken from a drawing and then, um, which was possibly done by one of, or commissioned by one of Pope's enemies, the um, dodgy publisher, Edmund Curl. And this shows people arriving at his villa. So it's a, it's a public place, you, you could see it from the Thames. And the villa very much represents how Pope wanted to be seen in this sort of solid, orderly, and uh, way set back from other buildings, independent of other buildings. At the bottom of the engraving, which was published during his lifetime, uh, 1736, you see a whole lot of teeny tiny lines. And I'm going to pull them out and, and read them to you. These are lines from Pope's own poetry. Um, and it's actually two poems combined. The first couplet comes from one poem and it's and that's about Pope's Grotto, and then it's linked to this extract from another poem which describes Pope's garden. So you're seeing both the back and the front of the house at the same time, in a way. No, all the distant din that world can keep rolls o'er my grotto and but soothes my sleep. Content with little, I can piddle here on broccoli and mutton round the year. But ancient friends, though poor or out of play, that touch my bell, I cannot turn away. 
Tis true no turbots dignify my board, but gudgeons, flounders, what my Thames affords. To Hounslow Heath I point and Bansted down, thence comes your mutton, and these chicks my own. From yon old walnut tree a shower shall fall, and grapes long lingering on my only wall, and figs from standard and espalier join. The devil's in it if you cannot dine. Then cheerful healths your mistress shall have place, and what's more rare, a poet shall say grace. Let me just pick out some of the things here that, um, that might be unexpected, this idea of piddling on broccoli and mutton. Um, it has a, quite a different association now. We might think he might be urinating on his vegetable patch. And I think that people are using urine again as a fertilizer, but he doesn't mean that. He means kind of toying with his food. So not gorging on it. Remember that wonderful description of Johnson kind of obsessively eating his, his food, but just kind of picking at it delicately with his, with his, his, his knife and fork maybe. Um, and he's also he's referring to the sort of the, the the meat and fish that comes from very nearby. This is not something that's bought from the other side of the world, and it's not fancy food. Turbot might be a food eaten by the by the very rich, but he's getting local fish. And if you saw um, Catherine talking about uh, Turner's food, you might have noticed that in in Turner's painting and then engraving of the destruction of Pope's Villa, there's an image of um, eel catching in the Thames. So Pope could easily have mentioned eels as well as gudgeons and flounders. Um, and these, these are sort of quite common fish, but it's rather wonderful that he also describes it as my Thames. So he's being very modest about it, but also proprietorial. There's another thing that I'll pick up in the, in the penultimate line there that I'm going to come back to. So I'm putting this poem up and then I'm going to take an excursion and, and, and come back. He talks about cheerful healths. And that means the practice of, of drinking toasts, you know, your very good health, raising a glass and talk and, and offering um, people's uh, drinking to people's health. And this is, again, something that Clive Francis has talked about. And we can talk about more in the question and answer session if you'd like. So what I'm going to do now is to describe the extremes of luxury and poverty between which Pope positions himself and his culinary and moral go golden mute golden mean and then I'll report on what we can be can be deduced from both his poetry and his correspondence and what what his friends say about him about what it might actually have been like to dine with Pope. In his poetry Pope used scarcity and plenty as symbols of cultural merit and moral worth. Let's look first at the starving poet, a poet who could not afford to build himself a villa on the Thames. And here's a wonderful painting by William Hogarth. It dates from 1733 to 35. So it, it post dates the, the, big, the first publication of Pope's The Dunciad and it takes some hints from him. And in it, you can see in the sitting in the window on the left is the poet scratching his head, just hoping that, you know, to scratch some ideas into it. His wife is mending his clothes. It looks like he's only got one pair of trousers. He's wearing no trousers at all at the moment. She has to mend them before he can go out. And coming in through the door is a milkmaid presenting a tally. This is the bill that he is unable to pay. I'm going to show you an engraving of this because it's a bit easier to pick the details out. So that it's reversed because it's an engraving. And in the background, uh, just behind the poet, you can see a, a, a squalling baby crying in its cot. It's going hungry because they can't buy any more milk for it. And on the left, at the sort of knee level of the milkmaid, a dog is stealing the last chop. This is the only food that this family have in their house. You can see above the, the, the dog, there's a, a totally empty cupboard. So these people are reduced to uh, starvation because the poet isn't able to make any money at all from his writings. Again, the print has a, a quotation from Pope at the bottom of it, like the, the print of Pope's Villa. Um, and Pope's The Dunciad is a poem he first started publishing in 1729 and published installments and different versions of and, and pretty much until he died, is a mock epic about the, the degradation of culture that from top to bottom, from the patrons who are supposed to support culture to the poets who are supposed to write it, there's been a kind of dumbing down, a, a, a duncifying of culture. And this quotation from The Dunciad says, 
studious he sat with all his books around, sinking from thought to thought of vast profound, plunged for his sense but found no bottom there, then writ and floundered on in more despair. So he's, he's up in his garret, but he's sinking lower and lower into the depths of his misery because he has no inspiration. There's no um, Heliconian spring flourishing there. There's some other descriptions of dunces in their garrets, in their little cheap attic rooms in Pope's writing. Another passage in the Dunciad and one in his wonderful epistle to Arbuthnot, which I think you might find even more relevant. In the Dunciad, he describes one cell there is concealed from vulgar eye, the cave of poverty and poetry. Keen hollow winds howl through the bleak recess, emblems of music caused by emptiness. Hence bards like Proteus long in vain tied down, escaping monsters and amaze the town. This is a very sort of coded symbolic way of saying that the poet is living in this kind of cave-like attic, the cave of poverty, but his stomach too is like a cave, an empty cave, and the keen hollow winds that are blowing through his broken window are also the rumblings of his stomach. So the, um, the inspiration for his writing is his own emptiness. He has to write something so he can sell it in order to make some money. And then he's going to write something bizarre and monstrous to amaze the town. Something similar is happening in the epistle to Arbuthnot. There, there are winds coming in through the broken window, the soft zephyrs, he says ironically. And the, um, the poet uses as, as his excuse for writing he, that he's obliged by hunger and requests to friends. He's, he's, he's saying, um, no, I didn't really mean to write this. I don't, I don't take this seriously, but my friends have begged me to publish it. Um, it's not very good. I haven't had time to finish it, um, but do please take it. So he's saying that the, the poet is so desperate that he's willing to, um, to sell bad poetry in order to make some money to, to pay his bills. Now, nowadays, I'm pretty certain we're more sympathetic to people who have to choose between heating and eating, or like this family are too poor to do either. But the point of Pope's satire is that, that what he's claiming that poets are poor because they're bad. You know, if they were any good, they would be able to earn money through their writings and they wouldn't be in this desperate position. Um, that their inspiration isn't coming from deep wells of classical inspiration, but it's just coming from the rumblings of an empty stomach. There's another poet he describes in, in the Dunciad, I'll touch on more briefly, and he's saying that this poet, Leonard Wellstead, his inspiration is beer, that he drinks a lot of beer, and this inspires him to write a poetry which, which is itself then like beer, though stale, not ripe, though thin, yet never clear, so sweetly mawkish and so smoothly dull, heady, not strong, over, overflowing, though not full. So beer is this cheap drink that everybody drinks, it's not um, the more intoxicating wine, or uh, certainly not a, a fine wine. So he, this is a second-rate poet who's sort of pouring out all this poetry. And we need to know here that it's this is, is not a sort of neutral criticism of Leonard Wellstead, but one of the reasons why Pope is, is so mean to him is that Wellstead had attacked Pope's own writing. So this is re his revenge for Wellstead writing against him, that Wellstead was his political rival and so this is his way of getting at him. So there's a certain amount of, of factionalism in um, Pope's writing. It's not a, a neutral account of, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> there's no coincidence that the bad, poor poets that he writes about are people that, who write for the Whig party, his enemy. He's also critical of people at the top of society, the rich people, he says, who ought to offer um, critical guidance, inspiration, moral guidance, and patronage. And on several occasions, he, he writes, for example, in the epistle to Burlington on the use of riches, um, or here again in the epistle to Arbuthnot, he writes about rich people who build hideous, vulgar houses, um, eat really nasty meals, and are very bad at, at supporting other people, that they, they don't offer charity to other people, and they certainly don't look after poets. And here's one um, who's described as buffo. He's like a, 
like a toad puffed up with his own self-importance and he's been puffed up because he's being fed with soft dedication all day long. So lots of poets are flattering him and he's feeling the sense of self-importance. And at first he starts giving to them. He'll provide them with, with sustenance and food and money. But he grows more frugal in his riper days. He paid some bards with port and some with praise. So he'll, he'll buy them a drink maybe and say, yes, he has very good poetry, but he won't support them in the way that, that he used to or should do, Pope's implying. But still the great have kindness in reserve. He helped to bury whom he helped to starve. And there are some occasions of, of patrons who refused to help poets when they were alive, but then would pay for a headstone or a funeral when they died. This is clearly the wrong way around. Samuel Johnson writes about that too with um, the Earl of Chesterfield. Another way in which the rich abuse their riches uh, is symbolized in the, the way food is described in, an, in another poem, in one of uh, Pope's very many imitations of Horace. And the Latin poets Horace and Juvenal wrote a lot about how, um, how what people eat defines them and their, their taste in food defines them. In fact, the word satire comes from a, a coloring metaphor. It means stuffed food. So it's like, um, it, it's like a metze, a plate of mixed food or um, things like stuffed figs. It's a kind of a, yeah, a mixture of stuff. And in this particular passage, he's thinking about, this is Pope thinking about the libertines of the reign of Charles II, who uh, were such Epicureans in their diets and sort of burnt out their senses, really. And he says, if your life be one continued treat, if to live well means nothing but to eat, up, up, cries gluttony, tis the break of day. Go drive the deer and drag the finny prey. With hounds and horns, go hunt an appetite. So Russell did, but could not eat at night. Called happy dog, the beggar at his door, and envied thirst and hunger to the poor. So he's describing a, a, an aristocrat called Russell, who hasn't actually been identified clearly, who goes hunting, but what he's hunting for is not good food to put on his table and then to share with his tenants, but he's hunting for an appetite. He no longer really enjoys the food that he's catching and he envies the beggar because at least the beggar is truly hungry. So it's a pretty um, inverted, a pretty sick state of affairs. What Pope is implicitly recommending is the idea of the golden mean. And in another uh, of his Horace imitations, he says, between excess and famine lies a mean, plain but not sordid, though not splendid, clean. Now, I, this is not really an 18th century image, but as a sort of lifelong vegetarian, this is my idea of a perfect balanced meal, a good mixture of, of vegetables with a little bit of protein, a little bit of, of, of carbs. So this is my, my modern idea of a mean. Pope wasn't um, necessarily eating this, this bowl of quinoa and other superfoods. So what was it actually like to dine with Alexander Pope? Do you remember I, uh, earlier on I quoted that, that long passage in which he refers to piddling on bro broccoli round the year? And he's not just talking about um, eating himself, he's not eating himself, himself in the way he eats, but he's, uh, he's, he, he links food with um, where it comes from, his own locality, but also with sharing food. So a lot of his complaints about the rich is that they're not hospitable to the poor or to poets. And he says that ancient friends, though poor or out of play, that means that who aren't going to be able to do him any favors because they don't have any money and they're not in play. They're not in important power, uh, positions of political power. He still lets them in. So this is part of his independence. He's not, he's not dining with people um, in order to get something out of them. A lot of um, the, the literature of certainly the first half of the 18th century and well into the second half was, um, was about or was written in sociable situations. A lot of uh, literary clubs were founded in the 18th century from the Kit Kat Club through to the Blue Stockings right at the end of the century. And they were often self-conscious about being part of a, a club. And there's a lovely passage from The Spectator, where I think this is um, Addison writing about clubs. 
And he says that a lot of these clubs are based around meeting to eat and drink. And he says there's a varied scene of clubs and dominating the scene are a few celebrated clubs founded upon eating and drinking, which are points wherein most men agree. The Kit Kat itself is said to have taken its original from a mutton pie. The beef steak and October clubs are neither of them averse to eating and drinking, if we if we may form a judgment of them from their respective titles. So the Kit Kat Club was a very important Whig dining society, um, nothing to do with chocolate finger bis biscuits, but to do with mutton pies um, named after their maker, Mr. Christopher Cat. The Beef Steak Society, there are several of them who met to eat beef steak. And um, the October Club, which was a Tory club, a high Tory club, they drank a kind of beer called October Ale. So they would, their socialising would take place around the consumption of these particular things, but then they would do uh, other things while they met to eat and drink. And the, the wonderful 19th century critic and novelist William Thackeray um, wrote a description of what the effect of all this clubbing was on the waistlines of the 18th century writers. He says, Swift was fat, Addison was fat, Steele was fat, Gay and Thompson were preposterously fat. All that fuddling and punch drip drinking, that club and coffee house boozing, shortened the lives and enlarged the waistcoats of the men of that age. Pope, he says, was the only wit of the day who was not fat. So this is definitely fat shaming, something that, that hopefully we wouldn't do now, but it is a sign of the, the toll that, um, that club life and, and the, the life of, of the mind took on the body. Pope, you probably know his health was very poor from birth and he wasn't able to indulge in food and drink as much as his friends did, but his friend Parnell, who was a member of the club with him, probably hastened his death with alcohol. Swift was very careful about what he ate because he suffered from a disease which was much later on diagnosed as Mernier's disease, but he was quite convinced that fruit made him much worse. But he was, a, he was a, quite a drinker. And Gay was so overweight that his friends, the Duke and Duchess of Queensbury, took him in hand and put him on a special diet. They took him to, to Bath and really restricted his diet. So Pope Swift, their friend Arbuthnot um, and Thomas Parnell, who I mentioned, who's not a very well-known person, used to meet together in Arbuthnot's rooms in St. James's Palace. And they would dine probably at three o'clock and uh, they would, the table would then be cleared and wine would be put on the table. And they would then jointly compose an invitation to their friend, Robert Harley, who was then the, the first minister, uh, for, for working for Queen Anne to come and join them at their sociable gathering, that they were there to write uh, a satire called the Memoirs of Martinus Scriblerus. And this is one of the surviving invitations from very early 1714. And what's happening is that they've all had a few drinks. So the serious drinking happened after the food was eaten, when the servants had gone and you can pour yourself a, a, a drink. And uh, Pope begins and he writes the first couplet and he's writing to Robert Harley, Lord, forsake your politic utopians to sup like Jove with blameless Ethiopians. Pope with a flourish. And then he passes the paper on round the table to Dean, Dean Swift, and he writes a couplet, and then he passes it on to uh, Parnell and then to Dr. Arbuthnot, and lastly to Gay. And as, as we go down the page, the writing gets less and less clear, perhaps as their heads get less and less muddled as they've, they've had yet another toast, yes, yet another drink. They were supposed to be composing this work for the memoirs of Martin and Scrib Scriblerus, but they didn't get very far with it, partly because Queen Anne died in 1714 and they all had to disperse, but partly I think also because they spent most of their time drinking and planning, setting the world to rights. They were drinking healths. So this is, it, I mentioned uh, that in that, at the end of that extract that appears under the print, they're drinking hells, drinking toasts. So it says, they, you know, drink glass, you're, you're very good, you're very good health. And toasting people was a, quite a ritual affair. You had to begin at the top of the social hierarchy. So you toast the monarch. And uh, when King George 
the first came to the throne and the Jacobites were disappointed with this. You, you might know the Jacobite toast is to toast the king over the water, meaning Bonnie Prince Charles and you'd hold your glass over the water. And then you would work your way down um, the social hierarchy. You do the, all the posh people in your acquaintance and then everybody around the table. And then when you're pretty drunk, you'd then start toasting women. And this might mean that they're the, the climax of the evening. Yes, and to my fair you know, Geraldine, to my lovely mistress, whatever it might be, or it might mean that this is when the evening had really fallen apart. And they can kind of count the, the size of their friendship group by the number of toasts that they make. And um, they're also quite interested in who's provided the wine and what kind of drink it is. And I can talk more about Lord Bolingbroke's Florence um, afterwards, I can explain what that, that means. But this is an account um, of a visit that Pope made to Swift in 1714. They're in entertained by Swift with a pint of the Lord Bolingbroke's Florence. The health of that great minister was drunk in this pint together with the Lord Treasurer, that's Harley, whose wine we also wished for. So he's annoyed that he hasn't been given a bottle of it. After which were commemorated Dr Arbuthnot and Mr Lewis in a sort of cider plentiful in these parts and not altogether unknown in the taverns of London. So the, the, the poshest people are celebrated in the grandest wine, but their own close friends are toasted in cider. And the, the toasting glasses are really quite, quite small. Um, a further insight into the order and quantity of toast drunk is provided from, in a letter from Swift written a week or so later. Swift reported to Arbuthnot that the circle of Robert Harley's friends had shrunk so much because he's out of power. We're, we're quite well aware of, of ministers um, exiting through a revolving door at the moment and, and no longer having friends. He's saying that, you know, we, we don't have, we can't drink so much because th there's so few of us now in this political club and this clique. He says that by the loss they were at for Hells, we came, we came to your name six glasses before the usual time because six friends had dropped out of their group. Swift visited uh, Pope in Twickenham in 1726. I'll say more about that in a second. And when he left, he presented Pope with a pair of silver drinking cups. And I think they might have been a bit like this, but if there's one, a knowledgeable person out there, I'm sure you'll, you'll tell me if I'm wrong here. Um, there are some uh, 1728 cups, Irish silver cups that I, I found in an auctioneer's catalogue, but I liked these because these are inscribed with um, verses that they're, they're a, a present. And Swift had them inscribed with the Latin motto, which, um, which meant a small pledge of friendship is huge. And he might have said that because actually um, Lord Harley had given Pope a gold cup. And he's saying, although these are silver and therefore smaller and lesser in value, they're actually an, an enormous sign of my, my friendship for you. So there's a certain competitiveness um, in this gift. Uh, the, I think the Irish silver uh, making industry in this period was very, very good. I once gave a, a silver spoon to an Irish friend of mine for her daughter's christening, and she immediately knew the name of the, the Dublin lady silversmith who'd, who'd made it. It was, it was, it was quite a, a small but um, skilled industry in Dublin in that, that period. That's a sideline. So um, I'm coming towards the end now. I just want to mention what things were like uh, in Twickenham when Swift visited England in 1726 to visit Pope. He came to arrange the publication of his satirical fiction, Gulliver's Travels. And the surviving, surviving scriblarians got together repeatedly. They visited lots of old friends they met in London, but they dined frequently with Pope in his villa in Twickenham. And there were probably occasions when uh, Swift was finishing off Gulliver's Travels, Pope was working on his Dunciad, John Gay was writing The Beggar's Opera, Dr Arbuthnot was, was finalising uh, a, a very detailed antiquarian study of ancient weights and measurements. And the various rooms in, in the villa when they might, where they might all have been uh, working away during the morning, perhaps, and then they perhaps they got together in the best room, which overlooked the Thames, a room which contained six portraits in gold frames, a pink and silver settee, six walnut chairs and three marble tables. And I saw some images of things which might be a bit like that. There's a, um, a National Trust property, Erdig, which was um, decorated by a man of, of 
Pope's class and age at around the same time. And here's a pink and silver settee. And I've come across descriptions of, of tea things in rooms where tea is drunk, where, where the colors pink and silver were, were seem to be popular um, for, for drinking that. The, the chairs aren't sort of comfy armchairs. They're quite um, upright walnut chairs, but that seems really common from the time. There's also a great parlor in Pope's Villa, which was probably used as a, a dining room because it probably gave on to the kitchen, which was on the same wing. And when Swift was visiting, Pope organized numerous visits so that Swift could meet um, new friends such as Henrietta Howard from Marble Hill and his old friends um, in July, Lord Bolingbroke and the playwright William Congreve joined Pope, Swift and Gay for dinner in the great parlor. But by 1726, Pope's health was so poor that he was not capable of eating or drinking to excess without suffering ill effects. He had a lame leg in the spring, and he tells us in much more detail than we want to know that he had piles in June. And in August, he was too ill to attend a farewell dinner for Swift arranged by their mutual friend, the Earl of Peterborough. And Swift wrote to Pope, um, he was supposed to be meeting him on the, on the 4th of August, and he didn't show up. And Swift was very sort of annoyed and upset. I always apprehend disquieted hearing you're out of order, most after a great dinner, for the least transgression of yours, if it be only two bits and one sup more than your stint, is a great debauch, for which you, are, you certainly pay more than those great sops who are carried dead drunk to bed. So Pope said he, he drank and, and ate in moderation, but moderation by other people's standards, because he was so, so sickly, even a little bit of overeating could make him quite ill. And there's a lovely story that um, an event that happened more than once, probably during this visit of 1726 or the next year in 1727, that Swift reported to Gay much later on. And, and it's a story, Swift and Gay wrote to the Duchess of Queensbury. And it's a story that he must have told lots of times. Um, so they would, they would dine, um, the cloth would be cleared, they'd start drinking, and then Pope would almost certainly develop a headache. And he'd get up from the table and, and go to bed early and he'd say, gentlemen, I'll leave you to your wine. But the wine that was left was just the remainder of a pint when four glasses were drank. I tell that story to everybody in commendation of Mr. Pope's abstemiousness. So Pope is actually being really mean. He's leaving the room because he can't drink anymore, but he's not leaving behind any drink for anybody else to, to, to drink. And uh, Swift in the same letter explains to the Duchess of Queensbury that he eats a light plain diet. He only eats half a chicken um, for lunch or, or dinner, but he needed to drink a whole bottle of wine or port a day. He, was, he, he didn't eat, drink massively, but that was his daily minimum requirement. And he sometimes or he repeatedly used in his letters an excuse for not visiting England was that wine was much more expensive. And as I said, when um, Swift had uh, Mernier's disease, wasn't obviously diagnosed when he's alive and he avoided fruit, he thought that set him off. But the current thinking is that actually alcohol and, and caffeine, who's a keen coffee drinker, probably were worse for it than fruit would have been. So let's close now by going back to that longer passage from Pope's second satire, the second book of Horace paraphrase, and, and think about it again. So he's saying that he likes to entertain his friends and that he eats a very modest diet. He doesn't eat fancy turbot, but the local fish, and that he piddles on broccoli and all the other food is, you know, the very, no food miles involved here because it all comes from his garden. Um, in February 1729, he actually served a meal of mutton and chicken to Lord Oxford, um, Miss Harley, when he visited. And he didn't have any wine in, so he alerted him that if he wished to drink good wine, that he ought to bring two bottles with him. I don't keep a bit of fine cellar, so you've got to bring your own wine. So he's, he's finding the golden mean, he's eschewing the, um, the luxury of the nouveau riche. Yet the picture is just slightly more complicated than what might appear. And the issue is the broccoli. Um, we buy broccoli for, you know, whatever the price is now, it probably will be more tomorrow, but that those sort of rather dry heads of broccoli wrapped in, in plastic, very disappointing stuff. But when Pope was inviting people to dinner in the, in the first half of the 18th century, broccoli was actually really quite a luxurious and exotic and a foreign vegetable. 
1728, Stephen Switzer, who was a very important um, uh, botanist and, and gardener, had to write a whole book teaching people how to grow and eat broccoli. A compendious method for the raising Italian broccoli, Spanish cardoon, celeriac, fenocchio, that's fennel, and other foreign kitchen vegetables. Um, one of his friends, Thomas Sakel, wrote to him, how spring the broccoli and fenocchio, they're hard names to spell because they were so exotic. There was, a, one critic has described a kind of Twickenham broccoli mafia, where there was a sort of elite group of people who grew this vegetable and would swap seeds. So. Um, Lord Peterborough perhaps introduced it, and Switzer praises Peterborough's um, pioneering work as a, as a vegetable gardener. And uh, Edward Wortley Montagu, who was then a friend of, of, of Pope's, grew it. And in 1727, Swift was sent some seeds by Pope's, some, some broccoli seeds. So it was this sort of you know, elite thing that it's, and it's like eating some sort of Ottolenghi recipe and needing to find the exotic ingredient that you, you can't buy in the, in the local Lidl. But also, Pope grew in his garden that favourite fruit of the luminaries talk. So I don't think we can have a luminaries talk without mentioning the pineapple. And Pope, as Paul Richen shows in his wonderful um, virtual Arcadia, Pope had a heated greenhouse in which he grew this exotic fruit, which is in itself a symbol of hospitality as well as wealth. So you are what you eat. You know, Pope is, um, is, is, a, is a learned classical abstruse poet with some quite fancy tastes, but he is always trying for the golden meal, me, golden meal, the golden mean, and also trying to be a good host. So let us end with this final quotation from his friend John Boyle, and I would say the Earl of Orrery, but I can't pronounce um, a word with quite so many R's in it. Let's end with this quotation. He treated his friends with a politeness that charmed and a generosity that was much to his honour. Every guest was made happy within his doors. Pleasure dwelt under his roof and elegance presided at his table. So I think whining and dining with Alexander Pope might have been a very pleasurable affair.